Happiness as an aim is shallow and weak. It cannot withstand suffering. Obviously, because when you're suffering, you're not happy. And if the purpose of life is to be happy, then when you're suffering, your life has no meaning. And then if you're suffering and there's no meaning in the suffering, then you're really suffering. That's right, really right. hell. First of all, don't aim at being happy because that's just not going to work, especially when the storms come and the barbarians are beating at the gate. You can just forget about that. And there's going to be times in your life where you're suffering so much you can't believe it. And so you're going to need something a hell of a lot more robust than happiness to get you through that. And then you might say, well, what's more robust than happiness? Or maybe even what's more robust than pain? How about adventure? How about we go out and sail the uncharted seas, you know? Your life isn't meaningful. The nihilists have got it right. There's no meaning in your life. And because of that, there's no reason for you to accept any responsibility. So you can live a responsibility-free life and maybe one of impulsive pleasure-seeking, but a responsibility-free life. But the price you pay is that it doesn't get to be meaningful. Or you could say to someone, no, we're going to do the opposite. We're going to say, you can live a meaningful life, but it's only going to be as meaningful as the amount of responsibility that you're willing to bear. And then you might say, well, what would people choose? Because everybody also always makes noises about wanting to have a meaningful life. But if the price you pay for that is the adoption of responsibility, then it's not so obvious that people would choose meaning over, you know, over pointless pursuits if they had to, if the benefit they got for choosing the pointless pursuits was that they really didn't have to care about anything they ever did, right? It's no responsibility. Life is suffering, that's clear. There is no more basic irrefutable truth. It's basically what God tells Adam and Eve immediately before he kicks them out of paradise. What in the world should be done about that? The simplest, most obvious and most direct answer. Pursue pleasure, follow your impulses, live for the moment, do what's expedient, lie, cheat, steal, deceive, manipulate, but don't get caught in an ultimately meaningless universe. What possible difference could it make? And this is by no means a new idea. The fact of life's tragedy and the suffering that is part of it has been used to justify the pursuit of immediate selfish gratification for a very long time. The Pleasure of expediency may be fleeting, but it's pleasure nonetheless. And that's something to stack up against the terror and pain of existence. Every man for himself and the devil take the hindmost, as the old proverb has it. Why not simply take everything you can get whenever the opportunity arises? Why not determine to live in that manner? Or is there an alternative more powerful and more compelling? Our ancestors worked out very sophisticated answers to such questions, but we still don't understand them very well. This is because they are in large part still implicit, manifest primarily in ritual and myth, and as of yet incompletely articulated. We act them out and represent them in stories, but we're not yet wise enough to formulate them explicitly. We're still chimps in a troop or wolves in a pack. We know how to behave. We know who's who and why. We've learned that through experience. Our knowledge has been shaped by our interaction with others. We've established predictable routines and patterns of behavior, but we don't really understand them or know where they originated. They've evolved over great expanses of time. No one was formulating them explicitly, at least not in the dimmest reaches of the past, even though we've been telling each other how to act forever. One day, however, not so long ago, we woke up. We were already doing, but we started noticing what we were doing. We started using our bodies as devices to represent their own actions. We started imitating and dramatizing. We invented ritual. We started acting out our own experiences. Then we started to tell stories. We coded our observations of our own drama in these stories. In this manner, the information that was first only embedded in our behavior became represented in our stories. But we didn't and still don't understand what it all means. The biblical narrative of paradise and the fall is one such story, fabricated by our collective imagination, working over the centuries. It provides a profound account of the nature of being and points the way to a mode of conceptualization and action well matched to that nature. In the Garden of Eden, prior to the dawn of self-consciousness, so goes the story, 
Human beings were sinless. Our primordial parents, Adam and Eve, walked with God. Then, tempted by the snake, the first couple ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, discovered death and vulnerability, and turned away from God. Mankind was exiled from paradise and began its effortful mortal existence. The idea of, of sacrifice enters soon afterward, beginning with the account of Cain and Abel and developing through the Abrahamic adventures in the Exodus. After much contemplation struggling, humanity learns that God's favor could be gained and his wrath averted through proper sacrifice. And also, that bloody murder might be motivated among those unwilling or unable to succeed in this manner. Evil enters the world with self-consciousness. The toil with which God curses Adam, that's bad enough. The trouble in childbirth with which Eve is burdened and her consequent dependence on her husband are no trivial matters either. They are indicative of the implicit and oft agonizing tragedies of insufficiency, privation, brute necessity and subjugation to illness and death that simultaneously define and plague existence. Their mere factual reality is sometimes sufficient to turn even a courageous person against life. It has been my experience, however, that human beings are strong enough to tolerate the implicit tragedies of being without faltering, without breaking or worse, breaking bad. I have seen evidence of this repeatedly in my private life, in my work as a professor, and in my role as a clinical practitioner. Earthquakes, floods, poverty, cancer. We're tough enough to take on all of that. But human evil adds a whole new dimension of misery to the world. It is for this reason that the rise of self-consciousness and its attendant realization of mortality and knowledge of good and evil is presented in the early chapters of Genesis and in the vast tradition that surrounds them as a cataclysm of cosmic magnitude. Conscious human malevolence can break the spirit even tragedy could not shake. I remember discovering with her that one of my clients had been shocked into years of serious post-traumatic stress disorder, daily physical shaking and terror, and chronic nightly insomnia by the mere expression on her enraged, drunken boyfriend's face. His fallen countenance, Genesis 4-5, indicated his clear and conscious desire to do her harm. She was more naive than she should have been, and that predisposed her to the trauma, but that's not the point. The voluntary evil we do one another can be profoundly and permanently damaging, even to the strong. And what is it precisely that motivates such evil? It doesn't make itself manifest merely in consequence of the hard lot of life. It doesn't even emerge simply because of failure itself or because of the disappointment and bitterness that failure often and understandably engenders. But the hard lot of life, magnified by the consequence of continually rejected sacrifices, however poorly conceptualized, however half-heartedly executed, that will bend and twist people into the truly monstrous forms who then begin consciously to work evil who then begin to generate for themselves and others little besides pain and suffering, and who do it for the sake of that pain and suffering, and who do it for the sake of that pain and suffering. In that manner, a truly vicious circle takes hold, begrudging sacrifice half-heartedly undertaken, rejection of that sacrifice by God or by reality. Take your pick, angry resentment generated by that rejection descent into bitterness and the desire for revenge, sacrifice undertaken even more begrudgingly or refused altogether. And it's hell itself that serves as the destination place of that downward spiral. Life is indeed nasty, brutish and short, as the English philosopher Thomas Hobbes so memorably remarked. But man's capacity for evil makes it worse. This means that the central problem of life the dealing with its brute facts is not merely what and how to sacrifice to diminish suffering, but what and how to sacrifice to diminish suffering and evil, the conscious and voluntary and vengeful source of the worst suffering. It was from this that I drew my fundamental moral conclusions. Aim up, pay attention, fix what you can fix. 
Don't be arrogant in your knowledge. Strive for humility because totalitarian pride manifests itself in intolerance, oppression, torture and death. Become aware of your own insufficiency. You come aware of your own insufficiency, your cowardice, malevolence, resentment and hatred. Consider the murderousness of your own spirit before you dare accuse others and before you attempt to repair the fabric of the world. Maybe it's not the world that's at fault. Maybe it's you. You've failed to make the mark. You've missed the target. You've fallen short of the glory of God. You've sinned. And all of that is your contribution to the insufficiency and evil of the world. And above all, don't lie. Don't lie about anything ever. Lying leads to hell. It was the great and the small lies of the Nazi and communist states that produced the deaths of millions of people. Consider then that the alleviation of unnecessary pain and suffering is a good. Make that an axiom. To the best of my ability, I will act in a manner that leads to the alleviation of unnecessary pain and suffering. You have now placed at the pinnacle of your moral hierarchy a set of presuppositions and actions aimed at the betterment of being. Why? Because we know the alternative. The alternative was the 20th century. The alternative was so close to hell that the difference is not worth discussing. And the opposite of hell is heaven. To place the alleviation of unnecessary pain and suffering at the pinnacle of your hierarchy of value is to work to bring about the kingdom of God on earth. That's a state and a state of mind at the same time. Jung observed that the construction of such a moral hierarchy was inevitable, although it could remain poorly arranged and internally self-contradictory. For Jung, whatever was at the top of an individual's moral hierarchy was, for all intents and purposes, that person's ultimate value, that person's God. It was what the person acted out. It was what the person believed most deeply. Something enacted is not a fact or even a set of facts. Instead, it's a personality or more precisely, a choice between two opposing personalities. It's Sherlock Holmes or Moriarty. It's Batman or the Joker. It's Superman or Lex Luthor, Charles Francis Xavier or Magneto, and Thor or Loki. It's Abel or Cain. And it's Christ or Satan. If it's working for the ennobling of being, for the establishment of paradise, then it's Christ. If it's working for the destruction of being, for the generation and propagation of unnecessary suffering and pain, then it's Satan. That's the inescapable archetypal reality. Expedience is the following of blind impulse. It's short-term gain. It's narrow and selfish. It lies to get its way. It takes nothing into account. It's immature and irresponsible. Meaning is its mature replacement, meaning emerges when impulses are regulated, organized and unified. I Meaning emerges from the interplay between the possibilities of the world and the value structure operating within that world. If the value structure is aimed at the betterment of being, the meaning revealed will be life-sustaining. It will provide the antidote for chaos and suffering. It will make everything matter. It will make everything better. If you act properly, your actions allow you to be psychologically integrated now and tomorrow and into the future while you benefit yourself, your family and the broader world around you. Everything will stack up and align along a single axis. Everything will come together. This produces maximal meaning. This stacking up is a place in space and time whose existence we can detect with our ability to experience more than is simply revealed here and now by our senses which are obviously limited to their information gathering and representation gathering and representational capacity, meaning Trump's expedience, meaning gratifies all impulses now and forever. That's why we can detect it. If you decide that you're not justified in your resentment of being, despite its inequity and pain, you may come to notice things you could fix to reduce, even by a bit, some unnecessary pain and suffering. You may come to ask yourself, what should I do today in a manner that means how could I use my time to make things better instead of worse? 
Such tasks may announce themselves as the pile of undone paperwork that you could attend to, the room that you could make a bit more welcoming, or the meal that could be a bit more delicious and more gratefully delivered to your family. You may find that if you attend to these moral obligations, once you have placed make the world better at the top of your value hierarchy, you experience ever deepening meaning. It's not bliss. It's not happiness. It is something more like atonement for the criminal fact of your fractured and damaged being. It's payment of the debt you owe for the insane and horrible miracle of your existence. It's how you remember the Holocaust. It's how you make amends for the pathology of history. It's adoption of the responsibility for being a potential denizen of hell. It is willingness to serve as an angel of paradise. Expedience. That's hiding all the skeletons in the closet. That's covering the blood you just spilled with a carpet. That's avoiding responsibility. It's cowardly and shallow and wrong. It's wrong because mere expedience multiplied by many repetitions produces the character of a demon. It's wrong because expedience merely transfers the curse on your head to someone else or to your future self in a manner that will make your future and the future generally worse instead of better. There is no faith and no courage and no sacrifice in doing what is expedient. There is no careful observation that actions and presuppositions matter or that the world is made of what matters. To have meaning in your life is better than to have what you want because you may neither know what you want nor what you truly need. Meaning is something that comes upon you of its own accord. You can set up the preconditions. You can follow meaning when it manifests itself, but you cannot simply produce it as an act of will. Meaning signifies that you are in the right place at the right time, properly balanced between order and chaos, where everything lines up as best it can at that moment. What is expedient works only for the moment. It's immediate, impulsive, and limited. What is meaningful? by contrast is the organization of what would otherwise merely be expedient into a symphony of being. Meaning is what is put forth more powerfully than mere words can express by Beethoven's Ode to Joy, a triumphant bringing forth from the void of pattern, after pattern upon beautiful pattern, every instrument playing its part, disciplined voices layered on top of that, spanning the entire breadth of human emotion from despair to exhilaration. Meaning is what manifests itself when the many levels of being arrange themselves into a perfectly functioning harmony, from atomic microcosm to cell to organ to individual to society to nature to cosmos, so that action at each level beautifully and perfectly facilitates action at all, such that past, present and future are all at once redeemed and reconciled. Meaning is what emerges beautifully and profoundly like a newly formed rosebud opening itself out of nothingness into the light of sun and God. Meaning is the lotus striving upward through the dark lake depths, through the ever clearing water, blooming forth on the very surface, revealing within itself the golden Buddha himself, the golden Buddha himself perfectly integrated such that the revelation of the divine will can make itself manifest in his every word and gesture. Meaning is when everything there is comes together in an ecstatic dance of single purpose, the glorification of a reality so that no matter how good it has suddenly become, it can get better and better and better and better, more and more deeply forever into the future. Meaning happens when that dance has become so intense that all the horrors of the past, all the terrible struggle engaged in by all of life and all of humanity, to that moment becomes a necessary and worthwhile part of the increasingly successful attempt to build something truly mighty and good. Meaning is the ultimate balance between, on the one hand, the chaos of transformation and possibility, and on the other, the discipline of pristine order whose purpose is to produce out of the attendant chaos, a new order that will be even more immaculate and capable of bring forth a still more balanced and productive chaos and order.
Meaning is the way, the path of life more abundant, the place you live when you are guided by love and speaking truth and when nothing you want or could possibly want takes any precedence over precisely that. Do what is meaningful, not what is expedient.